Assalamualaikum and a very good day. So I think everyone is ready uh, for result. Okay. All right. So, okay. So this is Dr. Faisal from IEM uh, Marine Engineering and Naval Architecture Technical Division, MNED. I will be your moderator for today. I hope everyone is comfortable and looking forward to the talk. Um, the title for today is Underwater Structure Inspection at Ports and Jetties. Let me read a little bit on the speaker for today, Muhammad Rizal Arshad, a graduate of the University of Liverpool in 1994, holds a Bachelor of Engineering in Medical Electronics and Instrumentation. He pursued an MSc in Electronic Control Engineering at the University of Salford. In early 1996, he began his PhD in Electronic Engineering, specializing in robotic vision systems. Prof. Rizal is currently a full professor at University Science Malaysia, USM and he is passionate about developing new systems and technologies for marine and general applications in society and industry. This talk focuses on underwater technical inspection for structures at port and jetties, highlighting the various methods available, including human divers, ROVs, and NDTs. Regular inspections are crucial for maintaining and repairing maritime and coastal infrastructure. Information is collected during this inspection, such as video recordings, digital photograph, technical data, supports consultancy studies, projects, and technical advice. The increasing importance of reliable and robust inspection methods is emphasized in this talk. As divers face growing risk in their work, underwater drones like ROVs provide safer and cost-effective alternative to traditional inspection, addressing the challenges posed by submerged infrastructure. Um, for the audience, the talk will take about one hour or one hour and a half um, afterwards, you are going to address any question arise from the audience. While you are listening, feel free to write the questions in the question tab, um, and I shall forward the questions to the speaker. Without further ado, I would like to welcome uh, Prof. I. Ariza. The stage is yours. Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Associate Professor, Associate Professor Dr. Ahmad Faisal, for the kind introduction. So today I will be talking about uh, underwater structure inspection at port and jetties. So let me just, uh, I will switch off my video cam and just focus on the slides. Okay. Um, so uh, as you uh, uh, well, uh, well aware that Malaysia as a maritime nation, we have many ports and jetties. We are, our land are surrounded by water. Uh, on the east coast and also uh, on the west of Malaysia and the east of Malaysia, we have quite a long coastal areas. Uh, so, so this is uh, and we have a number of ports and jetties that needs uh, regular inspection. And as we all know, we have uh, quite a number of underwater structures at the port and jetties, and these structures needs to be needs to be inspected for in order to ensure the safety and. In, uh, of the users especially uh, and uh, as we uh, know some of the ports and jetties are we, uh, they have heavy traffic not just on the uh, uh, seaside but also on the jetties and ports because of we do a lot of uh, product transfer uh, human transportation etc so we have uh, uh, we have the need uh, there's a real need for underwater structure inspection so this is the basically the the underlying uh, motivation of the sharing this evening. So, uh, so this is my. I hope you can see the slides that I've shared uh, online. So I'll be talking about some uh, introduction to underwater inspection, especially on port and jetties. Although not limited to port and jetties, uh, any underwater uh, the issues are easily applicable to any underwater structure inspection. Then we talk about level of inspection. Uh, current available methods for underwater inspection, a type of underwater unmanned vehicle that are used for underwater inspection, uh, of course, some example of inspection using unmanned underwater vehicle, the advantages and disadvantages of the methods, and some conclusion or summary of the presentation. Okay, so when we talk about uh, about uh, ocean, about sea, about water uh, water body, water columns, which may exist. Not just of on the on the the coast, the coastal areas on the sea, but also inland water catchment area, 
which also requires uh, underwater inspection. So the issues are easily applicable to both kind of uh, condition, be it uh, open waters or the coastal sea water or inland water catchment areas. For example, the our lakes, our rivers, etc. Those uh, where you have we, where we have many structures. Uh, in the water or uh, in, encroaching in the uh, area where you have water uh, uh, and we need uh, there are some economic activities which uh, which are we need where uh, where we need the, uh, such structures so uh, so because of this uh, the uh, regular interaction with uh, and the uh, regular use of the structures where you have uh, it the structures is submerged so there is a need for periodic preventive inspection of the structures, you know, as, as, as such as port and jetties, uh, to detect, for, for example, corrosions uh, uh, on cracks, whether they crack, or whether uh, how what's the condition of the growth of the marine organism like barnacles, etc., on the on the structures itself, the submerged structures, which after given time may uh, may. Uh, pose a risk to the integrity uh, of the structure itself when the, it becomes too heavy and too big, etc. And that will basically affect the, the design integrity of the structures. And then, of, of course, we have maritime accidents or brought about, brought about by structural breakdowns, uh, deaths, deaths, which are basically substantial sources of lost revenue. So these are some of the things that may occur when we do not do regular underwater structure inspection. And of course, we know that any inspection data collected will be helpful in assisting the detection uh, and also uh, to to prevent uh, for as a preemptive measure uh, for for further cost or for for further possible uh, cost of repairing and uh, uh, mitigation uh, action due to our uh, irregular maintenance uh, and also inspection and also maintenance. So, so this data is important, this underwater inspection data is important because this will impact in terms of extending the lifespan of our underwater structures. So I think in terms of the need for it, I don't think it's an issue. I think it's very clear that there is a serious need for such a, uh, uh, such a service where these structures, as much as we have a regular inspection of uh, uh, terrestrial structures that like building etc and same goes with underwater structures uh, where it needs regular inspection especially when you cannot have visible uh, uh, visual visible kind of uh, information of the condition of the structures because because it is submerged uh, so this is uh, this is a, just a serious uh, need for 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 such uh, uh, service so and then we have we talk about uh, for example we talk about uh, when you talk about the status of underwater structures, uh, you, you know you have the piers, you have the docks, you have breakwaters and seawall. These are uh, such a uh, structure we are, which needs to be assessed uh, uh, during our uh, scheduled inspection. And this process is necessary in order to assess the integrity of the structures and to ensure that they are safe for ships and other vessels to use. Uh, so these are example uh, you can see on the left hand side on the screen example. Uh, structures, summer structures, which which may uh, the condition may change due to the the rise and fall of the tides, for example. So you can see uh, the the barnacle growth on the poles, and uh, so you can agree you can see the corrosion example, the corrosion or the beams, for example, and uh, the the weight that the the growth uh, the barnacle growth on the poles it it, it becomes very heavy. Then uh, then. Uh, this may pose a serious uh, danger to the integrity of the structures. Okay, so these are a very typical kind of situation, especially in our waters in Malaysia, because we know our waters are is very is very healthy. I mean, the water is very good for growth. For you know, that's why uh, our water in terms of the temperature, in terms of the uh, the condition, there's a lot of underwater kind of. Uh, for example, algae, for example, the algae bloom. So that means the, the the it's a rich environment for uh, underwater organism to grow, to to proliferate. So that's that's the that's some of the reason. And then 
of course we talk about level inspection uh, we have three typical level first is uh, level one is a visual and acoustic inspection and uh, level two is where you have detailed inspection with partial cleaning and level three where you have highly detailed inspection so these are different level of typical level of inspection when we talk about uh, underwater structures okay uh, for example when we talk about level one visual and acoustic inspection so the purpose is to find visible damage or degradation of the underwater structure so a visual assessment is frequently utilized uh, for example you use an underwater camera in order to capture the visual images of the structure itself in the water and then you talk about acoustic sounding tools for example single beam echo sounders multi-beam echo sounders scan side scan sonars you know which are employed in better metric surveys and these are these are typical uh, tools we use to get to acquire the uh, visual and acoustic uh, images uh, of the structure and we know that uh, we this inspection is necessary also in order for us to indicate uh, to identify the location or the portion of underwater structure which requires more detailed inspections so these are very uh, uh, straightforward very obvious mode of inspection that is typically deployed and in this case in a, in a, in in typical cases we have a, for example we may have uh, we may have uh, uh, it it may or may not be done uh, by uh, for the level 1 by divers or it may just we may deploy something some tools in order to acquire the images okay the level two detail inspection with partial cleaning is uh, is this is more detail which uh, we where we we want it to clean or to remove the marine or growth for example at the, on the underwater structure before detecting and identifying the damaged structures. Uh, so in this case, there's a uh, the, the level of difficulty may be slightly higher. If we reverse and talk about the level one. Uh, we may have a diver with a uh, cameras and with some uh, some uh, some uh, some tools in order to record information but then it is depending on the drivers to go down to the specific location to take the images and in terms of acoustic inspection normally it is carried by boats or some uh, survey ships in order for us to do uh, acoustic imaging of the seabed or in this case, if you're talking about specific structures, you want to image the, to get the underwater, acoustic-based underwater image of the structures, of the specific structures. And we know there is specific reason why we use visual and acoustic. Typically, in water, the visual uh, mode of data acquisition is very limited, is limited by the uh, turbidity of water. That means if the, the, the water is very turbid, highly turbid, that means the visibility are very low, it's going to be the, the, the distance of a, a practical image capture is very short. That means it may not, you, we may not be able to capture the images, the, 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 the desired images just using a camera because of the quality of water. And if the quality of water is very turbid, that means there's, for example, there's a lot of suspended particles in the water. That means, that means, if you, even if you try to light it up, you have an additional camera uh, uh, light light source in order to lighten the to, to light up the areas. Still, because of the uh, the existence or the presence of many suspended particles in water, uh, the image wouldn't be you wouldn't we wouldn't be able to get a very good image or clear image of the object or the the structure that we are inspecting so it's very much dependence on the quality of water then typically people will switch to acoustic because acoustic are not affected so much by the the turbidity of water and you, we are able to map the 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 surface or the depth information of the uh, of the uh, structure itself so uh, it's a clear difference in terms of the kind of images images that we got from visual and acoustic visual typically is an intensity spread or intensity distribution of the light on the image whereas acoustic typically is about the depth uh, 
or the uh, acoustic reflectance uh, 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 quality of the points on the image. So you you got once you got an intensity based image for acoustic, you got typically a, a depth kind of depth surface kind of information. So so this is what we call when you talk about level one. And as mentioned earlier, when you talk about level level two, this is where we we include uh, cleaning or some uh, interventive uh, action on the structure in order to remove any obstacle or, need, for example, barnacle growth on the unnoticed structure to enable us to get a better image of the structure itself. So, of course, there is a need the dive, now the divers because uh, the most practical, as, as of today, the most practical and agile kind of to, uh, method is to use divers. Uh, so, the divers need to carry surface cleaning tools like brushes, underwater grinders, or high pressure water jet in order to, to clear, to clean the surface of the structure in order to have a better image of the structure itself. And this is very uh, complicated. Uh, it's not an easy uh, oper uh, deployment to do because of the equipment that the divers need to uh, bring it, to bring, to bring down to the to location in the water. And uh, typically, it is done on critical location that marine growth will be removed on the under by such to get information data of the damaged structures. Uh, these are very typical, but of course, as divers, they have very constrained uh, uh, duration in terms. It's a very short duration in terms of uh, in order to complete the mission or, or, or the, the the task. Because of this, then they have to have. Uh, uh, well, it takes it, it consume in terms of the number the, the length of uh, or you know the, that they have to spend in order to do the proper uh, cleaning and then also inspection and again it is uh, and uh, it is to depend it will be dependent on the divers and the the the, the expertise in order to do the uh, this level two kind of inspection and then of course you have the level three, which is a highly detailed and special. Again, uh, as, as you can see the image there, you still use uh, underwater divers. So, you know, of course, uh, divers because it's very uh, agile and they can carry the stuff needed for uh, to do the detailed analysis or inspection. So, in this case, for level three, it is to detect uh, the hidden or interior uh, damage uh, uh, to the structures, which is not. Uh, which we wouldn't be able to uh, deduct, uh, do deduction from the uh, optical or the acoustic images that we have acquired. So then they, they, we need to use different equipment, uh, different uh, underwater uh, proof kind of uh, non-destructive testing method in order for us to measure this hidden or interior uh, damage uh, on the underwater structures. Of course, of course, this include cleaning and detail measurement using NDT method, such as thickness measurement and hardness testing for underwater structure. So that means still the divers uh, need to be able to bring it down and to operate and to use the uh, respective tools in order to do this detail or the not so uh, the, the the hidden or interior kind of uh, structure integrity uh, inspection. Okay. So you can see this level one, level two, and level three. So one is purely observation. Second is you have intervention, you have cleaning, and you have uh, position uh, acquired images. And third, this is where you want to do more, not just the what's obvious, but what's inside in terms of hidden or the internal uh, structure damage as uh, 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 that uh, uh, that we are inspecting. So in terms of the current available method for underwater inspection, as, as, I, as we can see as of today, many of the uh, underwater structure inspection are being done using divers. So when you use divers, uh, divers have limited number of uh, time that they can be in the water. They are also affected by the quality of water in terms of the condition of the water, for example, is water, how about the underwater flow, for example, the turbidity of water, the depth of water, that whether there's traffic in the, the area that they're doing the inspection, 
uh, in terms of uh, 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 what kind of parameters that the divers are expected to get from the from the from the structures in terms of localization of the divers. Uh, so there are, there are so many so many issues uh, regarding uh, human diver, the use of human diver to do to do underwater inspection. But then again, these are the most, as of today, the most reliable uh, mode of doing it. So of course, uh, 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 not to not to take into account in terms of the risk to the divers itself, because typically they are operating, uh, they are doing, they are being deployed in an in an area which are very busy, uh, which are very there's a lot of un and uh, there's a lot of uh, 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 danger, uh, some risky factors which may not be taken into account uh, during the deployment. And there are also the issue of uh, repeated dive in order to, to, do, to have confirmation of the uh, structure, uh, the information acquired about the underwater structure. So you can see the combination of the 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 uh, the constraint deployment time and uh, in terms of the payload that they can bring into the water in terms of to be able to ensure the reliability and quality of the water uh, information gathered in terms of example uh, uh, if they want to do intervensive uh, action for example cleaning as a drilling uh, getting sample for example those needs a more uh, complex arrangement for the divers uh, because uh, as I mentioned a few times is it's not uh, it's a very uh, non-deterministic or very risky a very high risk kind of environment especially ports when the water turbidity are very high where you probably if you dive you can see maybe one to two meter uh, 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 where where the image are clearer uh, uh, where it's visible but no more than that, for example. So it's very difficult for you to to really execute the task without uh, taking to uh, without uh, at the same time ensuring that the data acquired are uh, reliable or acceptable. So you have the human divers. Then you also have the unmanned underwater vehicle, and this is where or UUV or in this case on the image there you can see an, an ROV. An ROV is what we call a remotely controlled, uh, remotely and uh, remotely uh, operated vehicle. Sorry, remotely operated vehicle ROV, which are cable or tethered or linked uh, with a cable to the host, uh, and these are used in order to do underwater inspection mission when the condition is too gen dangerous for human divers. So there's always alternative to human divers. Uh, uh, in, uh, instead of human divers, we can also use unmanned underwater vehicle. But still, uh, you, uh, the unmanned underwater vehicles still have to work in this very non-linear kind, of highly uh, 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 undeterministic or very very high-risk kind of environment uh, where the divers have to, work and we replace with ROV, and the or ROV needs to be able to do. Uh, uh, at par or hopefully much better than a human diver in, ter in terms of getting the information. But uh, as I said, even if you use an ROV or underwater vehicle, it still have to uh, tackle the issue of a very strong underwater flow, the issue of uh, turbidity of water, quality of water, the multi-flow uh, in terms of lateral flow of the water, uh, yeah, at different layers or at different depth, for example, in terms of ensuring that the integrity of the that means the, the fact that we we are we must be able to retrieve the robot if we deploy in the port, so they it still have to face to handle to manage the risk uh, exists in the water. So the second is to use your the uh, unmanned uh, robotic platform or under underwater. I mean, under the vehicle, in this case, an ROV, a remotely operated vehicle. So, if you talk about human divers, you know, if, uh, for human divers, they require specialized training, equipment, and certification, because they need, they must be trained in underwater diving techniques and safety procedures, as well as, as well as, as in the specific techniques required for inspection. 
So imagine for different setting for ports, jetties, for example, it requires specific tools, uh, specific uh, skills in order uh, when they dive because the constraint of time that they can spend in the water, they must optimize the time so that they can do as much as possible uh, quality inspection so that they don't have to do repeat uh, diving in order to complete the mission. So of course, uh, for human divers, they might also be equipped with appropriate diving suits, fins, commercial helmet, tanks, of course, and etc. So that means the equipment in order to enable the human diver to do his work is quite extensive. Okay. Then, but of course, the advantage of a human diver is the ability to inspect underwater structures up close and giving them a unique perspective on their conditions. And of course, uh, typically divers are able to identify and re report uh, any signs of damage, wear and tear, and other issues that may affect the integrity of the structure. Of course, the challenge is to take to be able to take proper measurements, for example, collecting samples and performing repairs and then maintenance activities. So they and as 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 we have discussed, uh, as I've said before. The divers may have to use a variety of tools, including underwater cameras, sensor equipment, measurement tools, and even interventive kind of tools in order to clean the area and to assist them in their work. Okay, and then, of course, I've mentioned about uh, underwater vehicle. For unmanned underwater vehicle, okay, the picture is it's not, it's, it's just a representation. There is, it's not a real uh, UUV operating in the water. Okay, this is just to, to, to demonstrate the uh, need for uh, like uh, underwater drones in order for you to do a number of uh, inspection in the uh, uh, water in the water okay so we talk about uh, uv or unmanned underwater vehicle you talk about it can be autonomous that means you can program it to map certain areas or to do inspection at certain areas or we can, it can be a control, a remotely free, uh, 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 remotely operated vehicle. Or it can be a free floating, or it can be a cable or uh, link or tethered or linked to a surface vessel. So there's a number of options that is uh, possible in order for us to consider using an unmanned underwater vehicle or an underwater robot in order for us to do underwater inspection. And of course, for underwater vehicle, is able to operate in harsh and challenging underwater environment, high pressure, limited accessibility, etc. That means, uh, the issue, when you talk about issue of risk to human being, there are certain uh, when you use when we use uh, underwater robots, then we can easily uh, uh, damp this the issue of or uh, settle the issue of risk to human life because. You, you now have a very uh, agile and mobile kind of underwater vehicle in order to go to the point where where we are interested in and for us to acquire the information about the underwater structure. So for some types of, uh, just to list a type, different type of un unmanned underwater, uh, unmanned underwater vehicle, sorry, sorry about the typo, unmanned underwater vehicle, so you have a uh, walking robot and walking robot this is very rare uh, but we have uh, so you have walking walking climbing autonomous surface vessel remotely operated vehicle so in this case when you talk about walking robot uh, or climbing robot this is when you have structures uh, which uh, where for walking like you see on the right uh, hand side on the slightly the bottom right hand side you can see a magnetic base wheel wheel uh, track robot for ship hull cleaning. So in this case, the, the track of the robot, uh, the tethered or cable robot is magnetized and is sticked to the wall or to the to the hull of the ship for it to do clean inspection also, cleaning in this case. And then you have the floating, which is in the bottom center. You have the black and yellow platform. This is our floating uh, surface vessel in order for you to do uh, in this case uh, inspection uh, of uh, from the top of the inter, uh, in water uh, structure condition then you have uh, as i mentioned the bottom left you have the from oceaneering uh, example of rov or remotely operated vehicle and these are tethered also with grippers with manipulators in order for you to manipulate some objects in the water 
So of course you have the walking robot. The walking robot is top uh, right. So this is an example of walking robot. It has four-legged, three-legged, four-legged kind of walking gait in order for it to walk on the seabed or to climb the underwater structures in the water. So you can see, you can see there's a number of options, but typically, typically we use uh, the bottom one, two, three. Right? That means the ROV, the ASV, which is the autonomous space vehicle, and also the climbing robot or the magnetized track uh, for the uh, mobile robot on for the ship hull uh, cleaning and inspection and cleaning. So if you use uh, 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 for uh, autonomous, uh, these are two very typical kind of uh, robotic platform being used for underwater structure inspection. First, on the left-hand side is what we call an autonomous surface vessel, ASB, we, where you can have a submerged underwater cameras or acoustic uh, single beam or multi beam in order for you to map, to get the bathymetric surveys of the seabed or lake bed or river bed. That means uh, you can have, uh, uh, so in this example, this is getting mapped, but sometimes you have underwater structures for example, we put uh, some sort of uh, artificial coral, artificial reefs, for example, and we want to inspect the condition of the reefs, artificial reef. So we can use uh, some, this such a setup where you have an autonomous surface vessel and you have uh, a single beam or multi beam uh, echo sounders attached under it for it to capture the images of the artificial reef using acoustic mode, okay, uh, mode of imaging. And then, of course, again, you have this remotely operated vehicle ROV, and the previous image shows that the ROV you can add a manipulators for it to do an interventive kind of uh, mission or deployment. So back to the ASB. So you have the ASB. This is the ASB is the top left. So this is basically ASB is used to perform a, a tasks such as environmental monitoring, oceanographic data collection, search and rescue, post, port, and also coastal security. So it is also used to conduct a detailed inspection of structures such as pipelines, piers, and docks. They are located in very uh, complex and hazardous environments. And of course, NSB, NSB is a very open platform. You can equip it with a range of sensors, for example, high resolution cameras or underwater looking cameras, you have sonar system or acoustic based um, uh, mapping system, laser scanners, which can also be used to get together data and images of jetties and pot structure. So this information can then be analyzed to identify any areas of the structure that require maintenance or repair. So of course, before we do talk about uh, uh, talk about monitoring and maintaining some structure, we need to be able to measure the condition or to know the condition and the quality, the current quality or condition of the underwater structure before we can do some preventive or mitigative actions uh, in order to, uh, to ensure the, as I said, the integrity of the underwater structure. So for ASB, the ASB, uh, can also be operated in, in almost all weather conditions and can work continuously for extended period of time, which makes ASB efficient and cost-effective than traditional inspection systems that rely on human divers. So the whole idea is we have human divers, which are also reliable, but also constrained with a, a lot of limitations. We can try to, by, by the, uh, the use of ASB, allows us to do a number of uh, uh, things which are not able to be done by human divers, okay, especially for long uh, kind of uh, long kind of deployment data acquisition, okay. Uh, so that means uh, the use of ASVs for the inspection of ports and jetties is a growing trend in the maritime industry, as they offer a safe, efficient, and cost-effective way to gather data images of these structures. So ASB, that means it's unmanned. That means it can be remotely operated. That means the operator can be on shore for on a platform and the ASB are used to inspect the, un, the underside or underwater structures in the, the ports and jetties areas. 
and uh, of course uh, because there's no human on board and the size is very uh, uh, small it's quite small, relatively small uh, compared to typical uh, survey boat boat and uh, ships etc so it's very portable it's very mobile and we are able to deploy more than one platform or one asv in order to cover quite a wide uh, area of the ports and jetties okay the second one as i've mentioned is the use of remotely operated vehicle so there are structures uh, which uh, require very uh, 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 detailed inspection so you want to you uh, in a typical way is to utilize uh, rov for such an auto structure assessment. So in this case, for ROV, the unauthor vehicle are controlled remotely uh, from the surface using a control panel and a video feed. That means uh, 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 for ASV, it's autonomous. Uh, you program the location and the path that you want it to cover. Whereas for ROV, it is 100% human control. So you are able to determine where uh, the location and to an extent is our inspection depth. Okay, and in terms of safety, safety is an improved safety, meaning ROV eliminates the need for divers to enter the water, reducing the risk of injury and improving overall safety. In terms of data collection, it's an improved data collection. ROVs are equipped with high quality cameras, light sonar system, and this allows for more detailed data collection and analysis. Okay, so these are the ROV. In terms of increased efficiency, uh, ROVs are also capable of assessing hard to reach areas that may be difficult or dangerous for divers. Uh, it's, it's, it can also be deployed quickly and easily. We are talking about uh, observation class ROV, which is a very small portable kind of ROV. There is another class of ROV which is called work class ROV. These ROV are for subsea application and they are quite uh, big and the weight are quite, quite also quite high. That means it's, it's very heavy. So it's not practical to use it for regular uh, port inspection of structure, but it's possible to use them, especially if the water is quite deep. Uh, so it's easier and we have a lot of uh, equipment, sensing and measurement equipment that we want to carry on the ROV. So, a world class ROV may be considered, but typically for normal underwater structure inspection, an observation class is, is more than enough. And then for ROV, you need a trained and experienced ROV pilot uh, to control the vehicle. The ROV pilot uh, uh, preferably should be familiar with the structure and the inspection goals and target. Okay, of, obviously, using ROVs for underwater structure inspection at Port and Jetis offers several advantages over traditional inspection method uh, so in this case where you're using such technology the asv the rov we can make the inspection uh, uh, process more efficient and more effective uh, in order uh, uh, to assess the condition of port and jetty structures and of course to ensure the ongoing safety and integrity okay and then we talk about uh, we talk about the the advantage advantages and disadvantages of uh, human divers and UUVs in underwater inspection. So it depends. Actually, it depends on the specific task environment in which it is to be performed. I think we have discussed. I've I've, I've informed you that uh, whether we are we are using divers or we are using ROVs or ASVs, it's still the, the condition of the water where we want to uh, do or want to uh, execute the inspection uh, uh, will be uh, one of the major factor. Okay, uh, as I say, if you take like ports or jetties in Malaysia, for example, in our waters uh, is very like uh, in our the ports like for example, with Klang port, uh, we have the Penang port. Uh, those are very busy kind of uh, uh, with uh, ship uh, uh, traffic and uh, especially at the ports and we want to be able to allow our inspection to be conducted regularly. So there is a need to coordinate uh, to ensure that the uh, 
the process of uh, inspecting are safe uh, and we can get the sufficient uh, information about the underwater structure uh, so so this is uh, a typical a typical uh, uh, consideration for example uh, for example in terms of uh, problem solving abilities of course human they are very fast in considering the risk they know what's possible what's possible what's not possible in the current uh, situation that they are in but of course when you use human diver it's always about the safety issues because the condition in the water may change we do not know an exact we do not have an exact information about the water underwater condition except very general uh, uh, parameters or general information about the the area and then this uh, pose a very uh, 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 quite uh, uh, major safety issues okay and then the, the second advantage in terms of sensory perception in terms of the sight the hearing and also the touch uh, by the uh, human divers is is exceptional but of course the disadvantages is that it's a hazardous environment very harsh weather very to a certain extent very quite a corrosive environment because of seawater so those are a number of disadvantages in terms of uh, sensory perception uh, consideration and then in terms of advantages in, in terms of for human divers uh, there's no issue of repair capabilities but for the, the disadvantage is in terms of the cost the logistic and the physical limitation as i've mentioned uh, much earlier in my presentation one of the major uh, 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 major obstacle is the the length of time in water that can be spent to execute the task for inspection task so because of this uh, limited uh, physical uh, limitation uh, in water so that also affect the quality the efficiency of underwater such inspection of course for uuv such as rov uh, and also including asv so we have the issue of cost effectiveness uh, it can be very quite costly in order for us to purchase uh, an ROV or ASB for our uh, underwater inspection task. But in terms, uh, uh, but in the short term, it's maybe expensive. But in the long run, this is more cost effective. Uh, so this is the thing. It is. It may cost you cost us a lot in the short term, but in the long run, it is very cost effective. It is cost saving kind of when we have uh, uh, ROV or ASV for underwater inspection. Of course, the disadvantage is in terms of maintenance and repair. So this is where you, we're going to have to be able to handle it well. And then for UUV, that means ROV and ASV, we talk about flexibility. That means it can operate in shallow or deep water, harsh environment. So, uh, the ROV, you can de still can deploy your ROV or, or ASV. And then the disadvantage, of course, reduce sensory perception eh? uh, because the environment and the kind of uh, uh, sensor device that we have. In terms of advantage, accessibility, disadvantage, limited problem solving because it's very, uh, it's very crude. That means you cannot, it's very difficult for you. To, let's say you have a manipulator on the ROV. You cannot expect the manipulator to operate like a uh, very complex kind of uh, manipulation, uh, for example. So there, there are there are issues in terms of uh, 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 problem solving or to do handle complex mission to do complex mission. Especially, for example, you have you have ROV and you have a manipulators, but you want need to do some uh, drilling or some interventive action on the underwater structure so it's going to be very tricky very quite uh, 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 difficult uh, operation for an rov and then of course the advantage to reduce human error and to to transfer the dependence on the quality of data to the kind of technology that we use uh, so that's why rov becomes more attractive huh? and then you have the issue of safety uh, there's no risk to the human operator 
because the, the the human will not be in the water but the robot itself will be in the water to do the inspection and of course efficiency because it helps to reduce the human error that uh, you may have when we use human divers for underwater inspection so as you can see there are there are a number of uh, a number of uh, there's not much actually there's not much option not 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 many but it's not there's not much option in, uh, in, uh, 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 that we have for us to be able to uh, uh, to do a regular uh, underwater uh, structure inspection except uh, especially uh, when we are end up only using uh, human divers or using technology such as uh, ROV or ASV and um, this uh, kind of uh, uh, inspection requirement is a bit more uh, gets more difficult in the port and jetties uh, environment because of uh, uh, especially when we use human divers because of the the condition there okay if we take example of the the busy port like Klang port or Penang port, you can see when you go to the ports, you can see the water is very turbid. Uh, in terms of the, the underwater structures, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, platform on the water, and you, the underside of the platform is going to be very very difficult to access the underside of the platform at the port and jetties. Uh, some of them, in order for you for us to be able to inspect the structures. Which may, uh, which may, uh, which may have not been, uh, which may not, might not have been inspected since its construction, for example, because the access points are very limited. Uh, so that's why when you talk about the, there's a there's a option to use instead of human divers to use uh, this so-called unmanned underwater vehicles such as ASV or ROV in order to get information about the such as under that uh, condition and of course when we use a uh, robot for example robotic solution for underwater inspection it is uh, is uh, is much more safer uh, to operate in hazard environment and provide more cost effective in the long run and flexible solution for such port and jetties uh, inspection and uh, UVs can also access areas that are too deep or hazardous for human divers. For example, underwater, this is talking about uh, natural structures, underwater caves, or areas contaminated with hazardous materials. So, uh, so, uh, so if I can recap, in terms of uh, 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 underwater uh, inspection for port and jetty, this is when you have uh, not the open water but enclosed uh, water body like. Uh, bay, or for example, ports or jetties where you have less uh, uh, in terms of the strength of underwater current is slightly lower compared to the open water, but uh, you may have more, for example, uh, sea traffic like ships uh, plying, boats plying the area, and this make it very uh, risky for human divers. Uh, to to do the underwater inspection safely, but again, our, because we are, we have we are lacking in terms of options. I think as for now, the dependence is still so much on human divers. Uh, if I can give an example, for example, coral reef. A coral reef. This is a natural structure which is not man-made. Uh, still, in order to do mapping, for example, of coral reef uh, colonies, for example. Is very dependent on human divers because uh, of the practicality of it and the complexity of the environment. So human divers are still is still the main mode of uh, method of doing underwater such inspection. That we but we there is a need to migrate to start to deploy this such a, a more technology based underwater inspection tools such as our ROV or autonomous uh, underwater vehicle or autonomous surface vessel in order for us to be able to do a much better uh, qualitative and quantitative underwater structure inspection. I believe when we talk about uh, uh, divers, deploying divers in the water, sometimes uh, it's more 
uh, to be fair to them, sometimes is biased towards qualitative data gathering. That means whether it's the, the uh, uh, whether the structure is intact, whether there's crack, whether there's serious crack or very minor crack, etc. But uh, very much uh, less quantitative information. For example, how big or the size of the corrosion uh, in terms of the depth on, of the crack, for example. So there's less quantitative uh, underwater inspection data compared to qualitative underwater inspection data. So this is this is the uh, trade-off that if you put di human divers uh, and they have to bring with all the tools with them in, in order to do measurement, it increases in terms of the complexity of uh, doing the inspection, the risk to the divers, and yet the divers still have to settle or uh, do all this in the limited amount of time uh, uh, due to the environment itself. And then for uh, as compared to if you deploy ROV or ASV or AUV and autonomous underwater vehicle, though it still have faced the same challenge in terms of time, uh, time, uh, trying to, to ensure that it is localized to a position and not being uh, not being swayed by the underwater underwater current, but uh, all in all, it is more much more safer to deploy ROV and regular inspection can be done compared to divers. And you, you can go deeper, you can go further, and you can go longer in terms of the deploying uh, deployment or inspection hours. So uh, so. Uh, uh, and uh, as I've, 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 as I've uh, shared much earlier, you can, you can basically see uh, if we have like, okay, okay, let me show if, uh, okay, such a structure, you can see uh, uh, the aim is uh, coming from the robotics perspective, uh, developer design, I'm coming from the uh, robot, underwater robotics perspective or designer or developer. We, what we, will, we are trying to replicate the task that being done by human being to be able for it to be done by uh, using an ROV platform or robotic platform. Because imagine if you, we can have a very reliable robotic platform, we can do regular inspection, we can do very complex uh, inspection and intervention kind of level two and level three kind of inspection uh, quality and we can do it regularly uh, and it is uh, much more cost effective and in the long run we can be uh, more confident and be assured of the integrity and quality of our port and jetty uh, structures uh, um, not just the uh, on surface kind of uh, out of water kind of structures but especially those structures which is uh, in the water so i think uh, from my perspective I hope I have uh, given you a feel of the, the, the difficulties of doing underwater structure inspection, uh, especially when we are too very much dependent on human divers. And I, I think going forward, I think there is still the need for the use of human divers. But I think how can we uh, explore more kind of hybrid approach where we can enhance uh, the presence uh, uh, or the use of technology with human divers and hopefully one day we can uh, look forward to where we can automate the, the, the process of underwater such inspection and we can uh, uh, not uh, be too dependent on uh, human divers uh, for such an inspection. So so I will uh, I will stop at this point, uh, Dr. Ahmad Faisal, and uh, I hope uh, I have shared some uh some field of some some issues uh, that may be of concern to some of you for regarding a uh, port structure a uh, port and jetty underwater inspection and uh, i'm open for discussion and from some comments or questions from the audience so uh, thank you very much i return to dr the floor to dr faisal dr all right thank you uh i have provisa so this is a uh, very informative um, content that you have been delivered just now. Um, and we have lots of questions over here. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. So I would like to forward here. Uh, uh, stop the sharing.
Uh, uh, you can continue sharing if you want to. Uh, if you have something that you want to refer afterwards. Oh yeah. Okay. okay. Um, let yeah. Let me read one from IR Dr. Oi Beng. Sorry, Oi Hyung Beng. Okay. Okay. Um, radio waves cannot penetrate underwater. Okay, radio waves cannot penetrate underwater. How can the equipment be controlled and communicated with people above water? Okay, 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 correct. Uh, uh, the, uh, I R U just now. U I R U is it? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay, okay. Thank you for the the question. Yeah, you're correct. Uh, our radio communication uh, force. Uh, it is. Uh, uh, there's a lot of study now. Very intensive study around the world. I know a few number of my colleagues uh, in a number of institutions around the world that are doing RF underwater communication, especially in the States and in I know of in Japan. But uh, it is uh, not so much for not so much for uh, underwater communication, more for underwater localization. They are doing it for underwater localization. That, that means it's a narrow band kind of uh, RF transmission, just to be able to localize the underwater. Uh, a robots or underwater platform or underwater device that they have in water and i know how i know of in uh, in japan for example they can go up to uh, i would say 100 meter 200 meter kind for rf communication but it's very narrow band that means the data that you can transfer are very limited uh, so but going forward uh, uh, typically uh, they are, it, it is using a, a cable that means for RF communication, for diver to diver communication, it is uh, you can now able to talk, but it's very limited. That means it's I think as far as remember one to two meter kind of distance. It's a very near kind of uh, for one uh, transmitter receiver that is possible in water, but it's not it's not uh, even uh, uh, either sea water or fresh water. It's possible now for short distance communication, uh, but of course not video. It's a <laughs> But other than that, in order to communicate from the seabed uh, to the surface, normally there is tethered or cable. That is, 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 is possible. Other than that, it's acoustic. But again, acoustic is very narrow band. There are now uh, acoustic transponder that can transfer very broad band where it's more, the data is more uh, richer, but it's very expensive, very expensive. I think it's not uh, maybe only some select few can use it, but a typical, let's say, uh, if you want to use it for diver, for diver, diver to diver communication may not be of course effective. So that means for uh, communication between the top of the water uh, in uh, surface and in water, for uh, typically they are using is a cable, cable type. Uh, now for there are some studies they are using optical laser based data transfer, but again. That is for short distance. For Malaysian waters, it's very difficult to use optical base, laser base, because we have a lot of uh, plankton and suspended particles in the water. So the laser is reflected back by the uh, uh, by the all the uh, very very fine suspended particles, and it's very tabi. So optical is for our waters, eh? for our waters, the optical is already is out. <laughs> uh, the uh, RF is very limited. For short distance, very really short distance, uh, we say uh, uh, not, not worth exploring for really long distance. Uh, but so it's still uh, boiled down to acoustic, and the problem with acoustic is, is very narrow and uh, is, very, is is not for let's say video transfer, data transfer. So it's a, it's a very uh, open area for research, and many group around the world are really looking forward for that because the idea is to to be able to have a Wi-Fi connection in water, Wi-Fi, which is not possible nowadays because the the platform is it doesn't work so well like uh, uh, uh like now uh, terrestrial kind of application. I think that's my response, Doctor Faisal. All right, uh, thank you for results. So just for information, so we have attendance of one hundred and seventy-eight here. I think maximum we have went to two hundred. So. It, this is a very hot cake today, <laughs> right? And we have uh, more questions coming. Okay, uh, this is from Ayar Malik. Um, and then Ayar Malik, he asked, uh, thank you for the very interesting talk. I have two questions. Number one, how do we determine the structure? Because you mentioned about level one, level two, level three, right? Okay, how we determine the structure has to go for level one, level two, or level three inspection? Okay. So that's question number one. Okay. okay. 
uh, question number two is, uh, is underwater corrosion serious enough for the operation to perform corrosion analysis to determine the period when the underwater inspection should take place? So this is, this okay. is decision okay. making. Very, so very, far, yeah. 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 very interesting yeah, and challenging. <laughs> Okay, so obviously for level one, two, three, normally people do level one. Level, level one is where you send divers or you send ROV just to, to take visual, visual inspection. I think like, for example, like the Navy, they use uh, the bathymetric surveys, regular bathymetric surveys, that's level one, just to get the image of something. Huh? But uh, normally level two is when you do uh, cleaning, etc. This is uh, typically for the... Uh, level like the oil and gas platform operators like our Petronas or Shell where they operate the oil platform in the open waters where you have the uh, typically in Malaysia is around you have quite a few hundred of them in the east coast especially and this is in like uh, the water depth is around 80 to 100 meter of water depth and one of the main problem that they have is barnacle growth on the on the on the jacket uh, the platform jacket or platform poles and what they need to do is that they need to do level one where they need to get the information to know how big is the size because and then they need go for level two to do the cleaning and this cleaning is still uh, really manual cleaning yeah. so i think i guess that's why it's very lucrative job huh? very dangerous also to clean the poles because the, uh, just to take example of the oil platform uh, jacket lake is that if the barnacles are allowed to grow so big and it introduce load uh, to the structure then they will this will pose risk to the integrity of the structure because the load now has the size has increased so that's why they have to do this uh, regular cleaning of the uh, uh, jacket leg in order to ensure that this they cannot 100 percent eliminate the growth but they would just want to ensure that the growth do not exceed certain size because that will do, uh, add extra load to the jacket leg of the the, the the poles on the oil platform okay for the level three question this is uh, typically uh, utilized by the pipeline operators like the when where they transfer the crude oil from the oil platform to land or uh, the gas etc and they have this underwater seabed pipeline and this seabed pipeline need regular inspection typically they will because these are these are 100 kilometers of pipelines. It's not possible to do level three inspection throughout the whole span of the uh, oil pipeline. So they have to do level one, level two in order to see which uh, which uh, which area of the uh, pipelines are more prone to possible crack on uh, corrosion, which leads to crack. So they are. Uh, this is where uh, they do, for example, inductive type of uh, cathodic and inductive type of imaging in order to measure the thickness of the pipe pipelines. So there are situations uh, in this where you have submerged uh, metal-based pipes uh, uh, at the seabed or lake bed, uh, no, seabed uh, at the coast, for example, where it is exposed to seawater, which are very corrosive, you know, uh, seawater, uh, uh, salt uh, uh, is very corrosive, and you put metal in there, it will be get corroded, uh, soon very fast so there is a need to ensure that the cathodic protection though it is there on the pipelines the regular inspection is done when you have identified suspected area of the pipe where the, the there is a possibility of corrosion a heavy heavy corrosion and which can lead to pipeline cracks and you know when there's pipeline cracks it's no longer inspection is now it is, is a mitigation and prevent not even preventive no mitigation how how you mitigate the the disaster to to reduce to, uh, to and to solve it and uh, that's a uh, i think i answer both uh. i answer uh, there was a second question I forgot yeah. The second question. Um, <laughs> yeah i think you go to the second question because um uh, so the second question mostly talks about uh, the seriousness to the to the to the level that we oh, require underwater yeah yeah. Um, oh, yeah 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 I think, I, think, I, think, I think yeah the corrosion is 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 because especially for the oil and gas operators especially uh, for Malaysia in this case, uh, there's a lot of issues, serious issue on what's the more sustainable technology to 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 check the corrosion, uh, the state of corrosion, because you're talking about hundreds of kilometers of, uh, of pipelines. Uh, it's not possible, and you must you must understand that not all pipelines are obvious. Some are covered by the by the sand, some are covered by growth, and so. so 
in order to inspect you have to clean this first so there's a lot of cleaning first with the so and corrosion is a serious issue for such an operators but uh, for i guess for port and jetties operators there are certain structures which are also open to uh, prone to corrosion and, and i know of like for example if i give an example like the ports you know you have this like what do you call it i, I, I can't i can't remember i do not remember the name of it like uh, like a uh, very uh, structures uh, is is a deformable uh, plate. Uh, it's a big uh, like a buffer or something where when the ship parks, it won't crash. It won't uh, do. Uh, it won't bend the side of the ships. But these are the base are steel, steel base uh, iron. That means after some time, this get corroded, and this fall into the sea. So you need some uh, inspection to ensure that the corrosion on this mat this. Uh, uh, structure which holds the material the absorbent material do not uh, fall apart huh? so uh, i think corrosion are uh, critical issue because especially when you deal with seawater okay yeah 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 that's very interesting Paul, because we remember some of the jetties might be going down without we even know it so that can happen <laughs> correct correct yeah so yeah. this is question by mr tam wai yang okay um yeah. Hi, IR. Uh, at areas such as Klang and Penang Port, with, which generally have low visibility underwater condition and yeah. uh, near surface in, inspection, which may also be affected by waves generated by passing vessels. True, true. How unmanned inspection provide better pro photographic or video records or okay. generally depends on your camera being used? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, typically, as far as, I as far as my knowledge and my understanding is that normally uh, even if we are deploying in such uh, uh, low and uh, turbid water highly turbid water that means that the water are very mud, uh, murky and murky you cannot see far uh, normally they, they use a typical standard system is an optical based camera it's a camera lah. it's intensity based which is a camera optical camera lah, which is a normal standard camera of course you can you can add lighting to it but lighting underwater lighting it can as I mentioned just now, it, it won't really extend the field of view so much, but it does extend it, but not so much. But typically, if you move near the structure, you can get quite a reasonable uh, image of the structure. But typically also, people couple it with the uh, uh, acoustic-based imaging uh, device in order, for example, forward-looking sonar, etc., in order to get a, a, a contour or a depth image of the uh, of the structure and nowadays there's a lot of system we call it 3d 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 imaging sonar where it gives you a three three dimensional kind of image and not just a 2d image of the of the uh, or what we call not 2d mean not 2d 2d means a, a, a contour not just a contour of the structure but a 3d that mean you got a a, a surface map of the structure so uh, so that means in terms of when you are when we are in the water a, a standard one will be optic image image some lighting and also some acoustic uh, setup uh, uh, 3d imaging uh, sonar or something device but how to overcome how to overcome the the wave on the surface this is where underwater underwater vehicle is important because as you go in the water the effect of wave is slightly lower compared when you at the surface that's why if the structure is on the surface and the imaging equipment is attached to the surface vessel, then the the the, the image also will be very dif very difficult to get a steady and sharp image. But that's why when you use an op uh, underwater robot, the robot will go in the water with the camera, so it goes near to the structure to get the image. Uh, but again. Typically now people use divers. Huh? Divers actually divers face the same thing. They also cannot really see in, in the water. I think if you dive, you know that <laughs> in turbid water you can only see maybe uh, one or two meter. Then that's it. Uh, you have to uh, feel your way around, right? I think the same thing with divers. But it's just divers uh, in terms of uh, because we know the structure. We can feel the structure compared to. If you use uh, underwater robots, it needs very good localization uh, system for it to localize where it is. 
so that the robot will know where the operator of the robot will know where the robot is because the operator themselves cannot see the robot from the surface. So that's why uh, uh, you need additional initial investment in term, in, in term, in term, initial cost, engineering cost in order to acquire the system. But in the long run, the, you can do regular inspection, more reliable data, etc. Compared to so to answer your question, I think. Uh, for a uh, typical is optical and acoustic, but in order to overcome the surface effect, you have to go in the water. You cannot, you, ha you cannot have the imaging device attach a floating device. That's my comment. All right, uh, thank you, Prof. I think this is a follow up from Mr. Tam Wai Yang um, question just now. Um, yeah. What will be the cost difference between manned and unmanned inspection in Malaysia for underwater visual inspection per day? Oh, <laughs> I think this is this is the ringgit and sena. <laughs> I going to be difficult. Yeah, yeah of course. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be difficult for me to say the ex exact value. But as far what I can what I can see is that in terms of cost, the cost of uh, using uh, uh, okay. I, 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 sorry, I wouldn't be able to uh, outline specific amount uh, RM etc uh, etc. Et but I would say this. Using a uh, uh, human diver, you can do uh, you can do uh, you can do regular inspection. But in terms of the amount of data that they can uh, provide from the inspection, maybe not as good as from uh, uh, using a underwater platform. Because on underwater platform, you can really attach more sensors and more information that you can get. Uh, which you can get from the environment and you can do a regular inspection without the risk of human life because when you put divers in water there's a lot of risk in terms because the port and jetty environment is not a very safe environment to be in the water where you want to be in the water because uh, there's a lot of dredging for example there's a lot of the sea uh, the port uh, bed is also ever changing the lot of uh, uh, what we call it uh, uh, mud layer, uh, there's, uh, and there's a lot of issues. Uh. So a lot of risk to the human diver. So when you compare uh, risk, of course, the risk is less using uh, underwater robot. In terms of regular inspection, you can do more regular inspection with uh, underwater robots. In terms of more data, you can get more data. But of course, in terms of, I would say that the cost will be expense higher in the short term, but in the long term, it will be more uh, reliable and cost effective. Okay, I was very difficult to say how much. <laughs> okay, thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. We we're still in that particular uh, area, bro. Okay, now um, <laughs> following that, uh, Mr. Jude, Jude Ting Mui Hing. Uh, the question is um, how often uh, inspection will be carried out? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Okay, uh, typically uh, for, for port, it's not like. Uh, we are, not we are not talking about, let's say, month, uh, weekly or monthly. You're talking about uh, quarterly or something. They, they, because, you know, when you inspect something, uh, there's, there's, I would say there's two types of inspection. One type is a regular inspection when you do uh, inspection in order to ensure the, to, be, to be watchful of, to be aware of the current condition of the structure. The other is uh, inspection due to certain accident or certain events. Where you have you have to do inspection, so I would say the regular inspection would be a quarterly inspection, or would be suffice for more than enough for uh, port structures. Because you must imagine, you must understand. For example, if I take example of Penang Port, is a uh, you're talking about poles, uh, hundreds of poles, uh, hundred of uh, many sites. So you we are, we are never be able to do it. Let's say month weekly is, is impossible, even monthly. So a quarterly inspection and there are based on uh, inspection cannot be done purely based on because we have structure we have to, we, we must inspect no because there are certain structure we there are certain structures which are in critical areas uh, which may if it's damaged it is uh, uh, the the structures is uh, is not uh, uh, is not the integrity is challenged then it may lead to disasters so, you know uh, then there are uh, different type of sites uh, depends on the the risk the risk of the area so i would say it's not uh, the regular it's not regular in a sense of every week or something but 
uh, we we'll say quarterly or half a year kind of inspection we suffice depending on the kind of area that we are talking about uh, that, that that will be my response okay okay thank you prof all right so i continue okay so this is quite technical uh can rov measure thickness of steel pipe pile this is from ir pui sin kong okay okay See, the, the, the tools and the sensors to measure thickness of pipeline, etc., is available. Okay, it's not, it's not something young, it's not something that is not invented, it's event is there. Uh, but and the 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 operate the process of attaching this uh, to an ROV, mount to mount this and to an ROV is also uh, solved, it's not an issue. But the major challenge is to bring the ROV and attach. Uh, to the right spot or position on the pipelines that we, are, we intend to inspect. And so this is the challenge. Uh, and this is what we call in ROV research the docking problem. How can you dock the ROV? Because in order for us to inspect the pipe, there is a certain tolerance in terms of distance of the sensor head to the pipelines. In some sensor, you need to touch, uh, uh, touch the pipelines and some you need you, is allowed certain tolerance. So there is a uh, so the complexity is how the operator are able to bring the ROV near to the to dock near the pipeline and go to a certain uh, distance along the pipeline. So this is a challenge. Yeah. Okay, that's the first challenge. The second challenge before we can do that is to ensure that all the pipelines are exposed the surface. <laughs> In reality, if you uh, we can just google if you want to see uh, the uh, youtube uh, under uh, kind of uh, uh, some videos on underwater pipeline you can see quite a number of them is submerged in the sand and there are some coral on it you know so you need to first need to clean it so there if uh, presuming presuming that the operators of pipeline have cleaned the pipelines now and then the operator or we can go and have an inspection of the pipeline it's possible but as i said because ROV is operated by a human operator, the, 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 the ability of the operator to dock near the pipe and to move along the pipe, that's the that's challenge. But it's, it's, it's done, huh? people have done it. All right, thank you, Prof. Wow, we learned that ROV operation and mission is very hard, actually. Okay, okay. so moving on to the next question by Mr. Liu Kenwoon. Okay, uh, dear speaker, thank you for the very informative presentation. I have the following questions. Number one, what is the normal lifespan of an U of a UUV? Okay. Okay. Uh, the second question is, what is the cost of a reasonably well equipped UUV? Okay. Okay. And okay. Okay. yeah. Number three, currently, what is the frequency of ins inspection for underwater structure? As required mm -hmm. by regulations. So there is as required uh, by regulation. What is the frequency? Yeah. Okay. 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 I, I can answer number I can try to answer number one and number two, but at number three, I, I, I may not be able to answer because this we need to refer to the act of uh, of the regulation by the port etc. authority. That one I I I I I I'm sorry, I, I, I wouldn't be able to provide the answer. So okay, for number one and two, I think uh, the the lifetime. For an ROV depends on the ROV uh, because uh, if you observe and you if you uh, if you talk to the ROV operators, the ROV the basic structure of ROV is quite standard. You have the uh, the the uh, that enable it to dive and to move uh, to to whatever location you want to move because it is because it is human operated. So it's not, uh, and it's not autonomous. Sensor-wise, it's not that advanced. If you make it autonomous, where you can swim on its own, then you have a lot of sensors and it's very, it becomes very expensive. And I mentioned to you, there's always world-class ROV and observation-class ROV. What we are talking now, uh, today, is mainly on observation-class. Observation-class, that means it's small ROV where there is no intervention uh, to the site. That means there's no cut. It's just purely getting images. Okay, if you if you search, I think a, a reasonable one in USD, eh, not 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 in RM, eh, a reasonable one will uh, with uh, like Falcon etc will be easily around I would say 
150,000 or 200,000 kind of uh, USD with all the equipment uh, in place. Uh. But with this, you need, uh, in order to operate this, you need a, a proper ROV pilot to operate the, the, the system in order for it, for it to be able to be certified and to, to be recognized. Uh. So that means uh, for, for observation class ROV, and it, the, the, the cost can go higher depending on the uh, module, sensor module, navigation module, whatever module that you want to do to add to the ROV. Because remember, ROV is just a platform. It's a, like, it's like a car. <laughs> and you whatever new things that you want to do to the car, you need to add equipment and the equipment will increase the cost. I'll give you an example. This is not ROV. This is what we call underwater gliders. If you Google, there's an underwater gliders called Slocum. Slocum, the basic cost is hundred thousand USD, uh, but if you want to add, um, you want to add new like all the navigation, all the all the tools, etc. It can go up to two hundred thousand, two hundred fifty thousand USD, even half a million USD. But uh, that's the cost. But uh, it is a very expensive stuff. Huh? But that is autonomous system. So you can try to guess up huh? when you have autonomous system normally. For remote control operation is slightly less, but you must remember that when you buy an ROV, it just just come with the ROV. You remember you have the cable, you have the control uh, command uh, system, you have the power system. So you're not just looking in the ROV, the robot itself, but all the supporting equipment. Uh, so it's going to be quite uh, quite uh, an investment, but. Uh, that's why I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I can, I, I can understand why many uh, port authorities do not have their own ROV, but they normally outsource to a ROV operator kind of uh, company because they just want the service and not uh, have it, not to have their own ROV and to manage their own ROV. So I, I know I, I may not answer your question directly, but I'm trying to say that uh, it's not, it's not, it's not. Cheap, like it's quite expensive, but but of course you can Google and you can get a a, a small ROV like drones, you know. But it, it costs you around twenty thousand ringgit, thirty thousand ringgit through I think Shopee or something. But that one is just for fun, just to, not for you to use in the ports because it won't be able to withstand the wave, etc. It will be carried away by wave because it's too small. You can even get one for I think fifty thousand, seventy thousand ringgit. With uh, but that one is is like a hobbyist kind of uh, platform, not for serious kind of uh, proper uh, underwater inspection for the authorities. Huh? Okay. All right. Thank you, bro. This reminds me, <laughs> if we buy a boat, sometimes the hull is uh, less expensive than the engine, so <laughs> that might be one of the case accessories. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Correct, correct. Okay, so I have one question from Mr. Muhammad Izwan Nizam. Okay. Uh, number one, is there any difference between underwater inspection for structures uh, for jetties and for ships? So is there any differences between these two missions for jetties and for ships? Okay. okay. Number two, um, if the defect were found on the structure, can we conduct the NDT or DT to the structure hmm. if yes what ndt or dt that that can be conducted okay okay i think uh, for the first part i think it's different because between jetties and ships because uh, uh, for jetties and ships first is the structure one is fixed structure one is mobile or uh, not uh, yeah mobile structures right so uh, presuming presuming that you want to do inspection in water that means you are not taking the ship on the dry dock it's in jet in the port kind of inspection then that's a challenge because jetty is a fixed structure and you basically know in terms of the entrance point uh what should be there what shouldn't be there you already know whereas a ship is a mobile if you try to inspect a, a ship in the dock in the water that's going to be quite a challenge because the the ship is also moving uh, but uh, as I said, if you're taking it out to the dry dock, then it's quite straightforward because the ship is static and you can do whatever you want with the inspection device. But presuming, uh, this, because you're talking about other inspection, I presume that 
the ship is in the dock, that will be the challenge because the ship will be moving because of the wave coming from the other ships and also general waves, surface wave. And you have this robot trying to do inspection uh, 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 on the hull, etc., on the uh, submerged hull, you know. So this is this is this is a challenge because in terms of localization and in order to ensure that the the ROV the robot do not crash to the ship. So so this uh, this uh, I think that's a biggest biggest difference uh, because a jetty is a jetty is a fixed structure. The ship is moving if it's in water. So quite a challenge because once uh, we had an experience before once when we try to inspect some structure in the ship in the port. And we can feel, we can know that uh, uh, the way the ship is moving very strongly when we when uh, there's another ship pass through next to the next to the ship. So the you can you can really see and you can see how it affects the stability of the robot. So that's a challenge, I would say. Second is on the the whether it's able, you are able to do NDT or not in the water once you detect the we say corrosion. And that's why I said. Uh, there was a question earlier, uh, do you go to level 1, level 2, or level 3? Always we start with level 1 because we want to know whether, where, what's the general condition of the structure we want to inspect. Second, once we know there's some issues, then we go for cleaning if there's no, if there is a need for cleaning. Then, uh, then or, or, or clearing the area for a more proper inspection. Then the third level is when we know that there is a potential crack, uh, potential Corrosion that might lead for crack, for example, then this is where we use uh, NDT, the non detectable testing uh, tools, in order for us to do the uh, to do the to do the to, to to ensure or to confirm the condition of the structure. I think for for as I said, example I give uh, much earlier, no, typically for corrosion because normally for metal based pipe, normally the the issue with corrosion. And when you transfer, for example, gas or crude oil uh, along the pipe, this is the, uh, and you can see, for example, leaks coming out. Uh, so this is where the intervention needs to be done. Uh, so I think uh, uh, no matter uh, uh, the selection of the NDT or, I don't think you do DT, lah, I presume NDT. Lah. Uh, then it depends on the problem that you're facing. Lah. Okay. Okay, all right. So I think we have covered all the questions, but since we are we are having two hours CPD, right? So I I would have one last question for you, bro. Okay. okay. So you are known to, to to be the specialist that we refer to anything that uh, relates to underwater vehicle, and some of the uh, cases that we've seen for boats or sorry for ships or barnacles or structures that have barnacles attached to the structures. Um, can can do 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 do. Do you have solutions or any recommendations? For example, uh, for certain missions, should we use um, tethered, tethered base or buoyancy based ROV, or is it good for have crawler, magnetic crawler based CUV to solve uh, such problem? You mean to for to clean the barnacles? You mean? Yeah, yeah. You mean okay, okay. Um, the problem with barnacles is that. Uh, if you want to just to get information in terms of how serious is the barnacle problem, barnacle is something you cannot get rid of because it's in the it's in the water, right? It go. Uh, so some people use uh, by anti biofouling, anti biofouling pain. They use anti biofouling kind of chemical material in order to reduce the risk of growth or barnacle growth on the structure. Okay, let's say there is growth on the structure and you just want to know the 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 condition of the barnacle growth, then possibly you just need uh, some information of image and also some uh, tools to measure the dimension. And because normally we can, from the dimension, we can estimate or we can estimate the size uh, because we know, already know the pipe size. It's just as you know, the bigger shapes or envelope of the barnacle, you can estimate the size and possibly the weight of the uh, barnacles. Okay. Uh, the problem is if you use a uh, crawler, you know, there's some design where they, the robot is attached to the poles. For example, this is uh, talking about all platform leg and jacket leg, eh? and uh, the, the robot is, uh, is crawling. Eh? Uh, the problem is uh, when you have barnacles, it's very difficult to maneuver around the barnacles. And uh, if you, let's say, put a crawler, I, I think uh, it's going to be challenging. Eh? 
and uh, these barnacles are also very sharp. They're, 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 it's very sharp, uh, hard and sharp. So that's why if you want to get rid of it, you really have to drill it out. Really have to really uh, what, uh, drill it out there of the from the from the pole. So it's going to be very challenging if you want to attach a driller or some cutting or heating machine on the robot that you employ deploy in order to uh, clean the uh, jacket leg, for example. It's going to be very challenging. Huh? So I would say for depending on the applications, uh, I think. Uh, the most important is to get information and to get uh, uh, as much information about the structure. We know the structure, we know the structure location, we know such original size, dimension. It's just when you get when we get the uh, more more updated uh, image of the structure, then we can we can estimate the next uh, operation kind of operation that we need to do in order to uh, get rid of the manacle or maybe to do more inspection. I think that that's the thing. Thank you. Okay, so Dr. we Mas have um, uh, yeah additional notes by IR Kasdi anak pulai. So uh, he shared here just for sharing in ship survey or inspection, authority allow the inspection done by UUV in case the ship cannot go for docking. So this is case by case. So okay. normally on the intermediate survey or 30 months after certificate is issued. So this is nice sharing by IRCSD. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so I think we have uh, gone through all the questions um, and we can um, recap the session. Uh, I would like to welcome Provisor for your last um, comments or is there anything that you want to share before we conclude the session today? Uh, okay. Uh... I think uh, in terms of underwater, underwater structure inspection, I think this is the future for the country. I think uh, because in order for us to ensure that the integrity of the structure is intact, we need to do regular inspection. So there is no way going back. I think we have to invest more and explore more and uh, try to utilize as much as possible the technology available in the market. I think the technology is available. It's just uh, in terms of the trust deficit, I think, <laughs> it's a trust deficit. How to convince the the industry players and the users that it is a worthwhile investment to go for uh, robotic or technology-based underwater inspection on top of uh, what the human divers uh, inspection uh, uh, data that we got from the uh, the manual diving kind of mode of uh, inspection. I think this is the way forward. Then I I, I think uh, with AI. With AI and the data analytics, you know, just imagine the potential. You can do, uh, you can, we can do projection in terms of uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, how long or what's, when's the next uh, 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 cycle of uh, uh, inspection that you need to do based on the current. This can be done. Uh, what I'm saying is that rather than go for every six months, based on the current uh, information using AI and deep learning and data analytics. You, the system can suggest, or you need to worry about this structure. You can do it uh, another 12 months. You know, this no need to do a regular inspection just for the sake of inspection. So this is where technology, data analytics, and AI will become a play a bigger role in underwater uh, the such inspection. And I believe all of us should be ready for it. And uh, I think uh, people like me, Dr. Faisal, I think we are very eager with this uh, trend. And I think we can do a lot of uh, things in this aspect. So thank you very much for the opportunity and I hope the listeners have benefited from my sharing and uh, I am open for collaboration and discussion. Please do contact me if you need some input from me. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Prof. Thank you all for joining us for today's for this informative webinar. We hope that the insight shared by our esteemed speaker, Prof. Rizal, have provided you with valuable knowledge and inspiration. Um, we continue to explore and implement the ideas discussed here to drive your respected fields. And we appreciate your active participation, lots of questions here, and encourage you to stay connected with us for future events. Thank you, IEM Marine Engineering and Naval Architecture Technical Division, MNETD, Secretariat for organizing the session, Ms. Ezati and team. And thank you once again to the, particip to the participants and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikumsalam. Have a good day.